Well done, Mariki. You're welcome to give her hugs when you go and get your coffee at the end. Great, I'm on. Okay, good morning, everybody. We did, we did, what, what time do we end? 11.30? 12, 12, 12, 12 o'clock, okay. There don't, are there donuts waiting? All right, does that sound fine? Mic check, one, two, good, at the back, okay, great. Um, I just wanted to pray after uh, doing a very short birthday uh, moment, I just wanted to just uh, pray, or so, yeah, pray, but also give you an update. Um, it's just me echoing, I think. Um, you can trust with us next year, this hall that you're sitting in here is going to be getting revamped. So the school is going to be doing uh, renovations. Um, so uh, we'll be slightly inconvenienced in, from January. Uh, but around about July, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, and it's going to be worth it. So for six months, we will be somewhere. I'm not quite sure where yet. Uh, but the Lord, the Lord we, yeah, we, we trust the Lord and uh, he, he will work that out. But we are going to uh, look for a new venue. Um, to be for a couple of a couple of months, all the opportunity, all the options that we've had have seemed to have fallen through. Um, so the Lord will be providing. Sorry about that. So please trust with us for a venue that we're looking for. Um, uh, ideally, something at least that can seat 500 is helpful. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, evening services we're going to be doing. I don't know a lot of services in the in one day. Uh, it would be uh, it'll be nice not to have four or five services on a Sunday. Uh, you'll enjoy the one, and we'll suffer for a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, so trust with us for that, and also you can trust with us for a new office venue. Uh, we know that our time is coming. We said this last year, but our time is coming to an end there. We, we have been looking. Uh, we would love to buy a house um, somewhere super close um, on campus in the middle of town that we can have trainings, prayer meetings, discipleship, events, youth, all-stars, uh, for that to, to all happen. Uh, we, are, we are looking, we are, we're actively looking, um, but I think if we, if you know of something, uh, please uh, let us know and you can put your faith out and trust with us that we can find the right thing or buy the right thing. Can we do that? I think for the, for the generations that are gonna lead the church afterwards, it'll be great that they have um, a, a place where they can permanently call home and have prayer meetings 24-7 uh, and discipleship all the time. All right, so I'm going to pray and you can agree. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness over these years. And Lord, we also trust you for the exact venue that you've got for us for uh, the beginning of next year, as well as our offices. Father, we thank you for your favor upon this church. Um, would you open up uh, the exact space, Father, that, um, that we need? You know all our needs and all the kids' facilities. Father, we thank you for favoring us. We thank you for your blessing. And we trust you. Lord, for um, a place to be able to own and for your kingdom to be permanently established, Father, for the generations to come. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Great. I've got a very, 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 very long message this morning uh, for you. So you can just buckle up. Um, we'll see how far we get before I uh, do it a little bit slower. slower. But you've got to stick out earlier. And... Uh, my first point, it's not really a first point, but it's the first one. No, no, before I get there. Uh, I've got, I, I saw a meme this week that I thought you might appreciate. Um, it says, being a pastor is not stressful. There's Duncan, he's age 22. Uh, anyway, I just, I just want to say that um, uh, some of you are thinking, Mark, your job is terrible. No, 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 not at all. That's, that's not my experience. Um, I wanted to say from, from my side, just a huge thank you. Um, it is an absolute honor um, and a privilege for the last 13 odd years to, to shepherd this congregation with, with the team of leaders, um, but it really is an absolute joy, um, and it's a, um, not something that, uh, that I take lightly. Um, I've got a lot of uh, pastor friends in different spaces, and some of that is their story, uh, that, that, that picture, um, but that is, that is not mine. I think in 22 years that I've been uh, full-time here, I, I don't think I've ever once walked home on a Sunday. This, okay, there we go. There we go. I don't think I've ever walked away 
leaving uh, from, from a full day, um, leaving Sunday night without genuinely saying, thank you, God. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to, to shape a generation, to speak into people's lives. Um, you, the Father absolutely dearly loves every single person. And every now and then we get a glimpse of his heart for others. Um, and it's all so worth it that we actually get to be family. Okay, so anyway, I thought that was funny. Nobody else did. All right, um, you can go into the, my next slide. There we go, more than a sticker. Okay, this is going to be super quick. Um, and I'm on the wrong notes. Here we go. Okay, so God has called us to be spiritual family in a culture that is broken and a culture that is struggling. And God, in his absolute wisdom, decides to bring a people together to do something. In Revelations verse 5, 9, and 10, right at, the, right at the end of the Bible, we see that he is coming to purchase for himself a people. There we go. Um, this is basically a song that's being sung in, in heaven. It says, and they will sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests of our God, and they shall reign over all the earth. God was, in his absolute wisdom, not only does he just redeem a people, and does he call a people from all over the world, but he draws them, he develops them, he makes them into something, and they become a new nation. God is not just interested in maybe having a multicultural church, getting a whole lot of cultures together and, and forming a church. What he does is he gets people from all cultures and he makes them into a new nation. It, it supersedes just the culture that we grew up to in and I experienced and maybe the local families that we were brought into. God in his wisdom wants to make us into one new nation. And in uh, 1 Peter verse uh, 2, uh, verse 9, it goes on to say that you were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. Now, this would have been super offensive for the Roman guy who just heard that because, I mean, his citizenship in the Roman Empire was, that was the big deal of his life. And now he just heard that you were not a people beforehand because in comparison to being brought into the family of God, there is just so much more that he has for you. But now you are God's people. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What classifies us as being a part of God's family is that you've received the mercy of God. Uh, you might have heard me say this before. The one thing that the angels marvel at in heaven is why, oh why, do these people on this little speck of dust in the middle of nowhere, in, the solar, in, the, in all these solar systems, God chooses to focus his attention on. And for this incredible heavenly being which we get to call father that he had mercy on those people that is what makes the angel stop that god had mercy on us and sometimes we take it for absolute granted where we think we deserve it you know of course you know why you know why, why would god not pay, pay lay down his life for mine and he did not need to because our life in comparison to his there's such a vast difference that there's no way we'll ever be able to stand before him and in any way justify why his heart should ever be open towards us. And when we really realize that it was the mercy of God that draws us into family, it changes the way that we relate with the people that are around us. So um, God wants to make um, our churches into a family, even though we're a part of a church of, uh, I think, in about 87 nations. Um, at the moment, I've got a few friends that are from uh, different cultures now and different countries. It's fascinating to get to know them. But when God brings us together, He's trying to make us one. And it's, um, when he places us in a family, there's a divine joining. It's not something that I decide that I'm going to join a church, but God joins me into a church. And when God joins, into me, joins, me, what? joins me into a church, it's because he's got a plan and a purpose for me. And there's a reason why he is actually doing that. One of the, the greatest promises that we find in Scripture is Psalm 68, verse 6. It says, um, God sets the lonely in family. 
which it doesn't mean that if I have come from a lonely family, well then, you know, the church is the place for me because I'm going to be able to find family. Whether you've be, been privileged to come from an incredible family or you've come from a family that has really broken and it was hard and you knew it was hard and you've been impacted by that, whether it was a hard situation or whether it was an incredible situation, God places us together inside of a family for us to learn to relate in a family even more than what we have. So when the church starts to care for each other, love each other, do something, there's a unity there where there's a unity, God pours out a blessing and he does something incredible. But sometimes um, it can be a challenge, hey? Did you ever have a, have a challenge in your, in your natural family? Not, I'm not talking about your spiritual family now, just, just your natural family. Ever, ever, ever have a, okay, don't, don't put those hands up, all right. Uh, we all know that your hands would be going up, okay? But God has put us in a family because when we make, uh, he had a plan to extend his kingdom around the world and he knew that we was never meant to be alone. We weren't meant to, we weren't meant to do that. Um, some people say that um, they want to be a part of the prosperity movement, and I think we should rather be a part of the posterity movement, which is thinking about the generations after us. Our heart as a church is not for, I mean, it would be nice to have a big fancy building and do those things to be able to make life easier, but to be quite honest, that is totally not our heart and not our dream. Our dream is for every single generation to know Jesus Christ, and every generation in places that we don't know to be impacted by him for every generation to pick up the, the mantle and the mandate of the gospel of what he's got for them and run with that because he has a purpose for your life. Um, but he puts us in families for a very, very significant, uh, significant reason, reason. And a family and a spiritual family, you can be in a family and think differently and look differently and sound differently than the person next to you and still learn to become family. You can have uh, different experiences um, which then now transcend the pain we've gone through, our ethnicity, our political philosophy, our theology, and, and things that we might really hold significant in our own lives. But when I, when I learn and I realize that God has brought me in relationship with others, God expands my world through the friendships and through the people in my life that he brings into my life. And I know that for me, when I, when I came to church, I had a big wrestle for a while, going, Lord, I was so close with my friends before I was saved uh, back in Durban, and now you've placed me here. Why am I finding this harder work to, to become really, really good friends with? But it was something that I needed to push through and learn to become a friend in order to be able to have friends. And through that, people that I would have never chosen to be uh, my good friends have now become friends over time and people that I deeply care about. So when we come to church and you, and you see this one and you see that one, you, you know, there's something that, there's an absolute joy that rises up in my heart. I don't know about you, but it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's wonderful to be able to see each other and it helps me to serve God and we need family in that way. So I'm gonna fly through this here. Um, in Mark 10, uh, we see just the way that Peter even, um, yeah, uh, I'll leave that out, never mind. Um, just how Paul relates to Timothy just as a son. He sees him as a son. It wasn't just like a nice idea. You never hear about Paul's family in Scripture. You only ever hear about a spiritual family. Did he have a family? Well, there's a lot of debate about that, but, but you're not going to really find much in Scripture. It's not a, it's not a major, but you, you see the way that he treats him. Timothy, we know that his mother and his grandmother, they were on fire for the Lord. I don't know what happened to his dad, whether he was an unbeliever, whether maybe he passed away when he was, when he was younger, I don't know. But Paul steps in, and Paul becomes that father to him. Um, the, apostle, yeah, the, the apostle Paul had an, just, uh, had an incredible revelation about family. In 1 Thessalonians 2.17, he says that he, he uses the word he was orphaned um, by being separated from the people in Thessalonica. In other words, he was saying, man, when I missed Sunday services, when I missed my time with you today, there was something which I was longing, which I felt like I missed. I almost felt like I was an orphan not being able to be with you. That's because he viewed the people there as part of his family, just the way that he was expressing it. There was a life-changing power. And then we see Jesus. There's an incredible uh, uh, part where um, his mom and brothers are probably getting slightly a little bit up, upset with him. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase the story. And he tells his disciples, they have words with, with them. And he says, tell my mother this, 
who is my mother? Who is my brother? And ultimately, he's trying to get them to realize that who my mother is and who my brother are are the people that really do and advance the kingdom of God together with me. He was messing with their world, and he was trying to broaden their hearts about the way that they embrace each other. Now, good news is that him and his mother were reconciled in that, uh, in that moment, and they go on to advance the kingdom of God together. But, but Jesus, um, you probably find, now he didn't ignore his own family, because we see, honor your mother and father, first promise, um, first commandment with a promise of long life. We are called to honor people and honor our parents. But I want you to get something today that God is saying, your spiritual family that you added into is meant to be family. Don't hold back, but treat them treat them that way. There is a reason why uh, I'm not a Baptist, okay? I think we've got a great Baptist church. Byron has just left. He's gone to, gone to Germany. Uh, but Scripture says that um, the Father arranges members the way that He chooses. So God places us in spiritual families for a reason because He has Ephesians 2, a purpose for your life. Because there is a purpose, He arranges you in the body which means that don't hold back from your purpose because other people are going to be impacted, impacted by that. Amen. So, when it comes to family, uh, people's, if God has joined you to a family, does that mean that He is the one to unjoin you? Sometimes we unjoin ourselves where it should be, we should leave that up to Him. But you say, but um, what if I'm offended? Well, it's not really what... What if I'm offended? It's more like, when are you going to be offended, to be quite honest with you? All right. If you're in a church, uh, you are going to be offended. If not, we can offend you afterwards and may just, may just get it over and done with. Um, because there's people. You've been offended in your own family. But isn't God so amazing that when we get offend, offended or something happens and we reconcile and we work through that, that that joining and that bond becomes stronger. And you go, oh, wow, man, I've been through stuff with these guys. And around the world, I'm, I'm blessed with the Every Nation, uh, some of our leaders, just their hearts of openness and uh, sincerity amongst each other. But you know that they've been through things. There's, there's battle scars, but there's been a representation of Christ and choosing to love each other, which is greater and that's what it's all about. It's not about ever being perfect and fulfilling my call, no. The whole point of fulfilling your call is to become like Christ. And the more we become like Christ and love Him and represent Him, the more He does things. So God places in our, us in a family in order to grow us up. Amen. So we're more than a, we're more than a sticker. Okay. Very, very quickly. Uh, my sermon today is going to be on, on honor. All right, some of you are getting very nervous. Don't worry. Don't worry. The Every Nation mission statement says this, so why do we exist? We exist to honor God. We want to honor God because it's about Him, it's for Him, it's He's first. When I position my life to honor God by in my heart setting Him apart as Lord, as Savior, and I honor Him, everything else is put in the right position. So as the Every Nation mission statement, it is we exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. There is an there's a, a starting point that we, it's about God, it ends with God, and it's all because of Him. I believe when we walk in the, in the honor of God, there's a favor and a blessing that gets poured out because of that. Amen. When we keep honor, the focus, it keeps us going in the right direction. It aligns our agenda like it should be. Okay. Um, somebody said the most important picture that you can have in your mind is how you see God. Do you see God as somebody that you'll honor, or do you see God as somebody who just needs to do things for you? How do you see God? Because those that know their God will do great exploits, that quote that we've always heard. How we see God is so important, and I pray that we would see God in a, as one that we, that we honor. When we, if we truly got a glimpse of who He is, there'd be two things we'd do. We'd worship Him, and we'd honor Him with the rest of our lives. That would be the, over, the, the response. And our hearts, right from the beginning, oh, sorry, God's heart right from the, the beginning 
when he created this world and made a place for mankind to live, his heart was to be able to have relationship with you. Not just for him to have relationship with you, but for you to have relationship with him. And the foundation of that relationship is trust. God wants us to trust him. And he's trying to get us to learn to trust him. A good relationship is based on trust. Now, I've gotten to know Bryn over the last couple of years, and now I trust him, okay? Not that I didn't trust him, I just didn't, I didn't, know, didn't know him as much. So the first time we met, it was probably about over there somewhere, and there was like a, something in my spirit you could see that just r- rised up. Like, Lord, there's, there's something here, you know? There, there's, a, there's a joining, there's an adding, there's a something that God is doing where he's, he's bringing people together for the sake of his kingdom and his, and his plan. But as I've gotten to, to know Bryn, it's been just wonderful because now if he says he's going to do something, I don't sit worrying all night, is Bryn going to do it? He's not going to do it. Do I need to remind him? Do I need to remind him? Is he going to do that? No, no. Bryn said he's going to do it. I trust him. And he's going to do it. And because of now that I know his character, it, it communicates something positive when I do trust him. Imagine I phoned him every time. Bryn, are you sure you got it? Can you do it? Are you sure? Are you going to do it? Are you going to? No, no. I'm going to remind you again today. I know the event's in two weeks' time, but are you, have you got it? You know, have you? That, would be, that wouldn't be trusting him. But we do that with God sometimes. We say, God, we trust you, but we worry so much that we're actually not trusting him. And all he wants is for you to be in a loving, trusting relationship. There is nobody better in this. In that there's nobody on the planet that we can trust as well and as confidently as your heavenly Father. Where he says in this word, every promise is yes and amen. Why? Because it's him. Because it's all about him. And yet we worry sometimes. You know, we worry about our relationship. We worry about our finances. We worry about our future. We worry about our, our destiny. We worry about this, 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 this. And he says, guys, I've got it. Look who you're trusting. When we learn to honor other people, Honor really means placing a high value on them, recognizing the worth that is on their life. When we do that, we're reinforcing their true value. When I honor Bryn for who he is, I'm reinforcing how Christ sees him. And he grows up and rises up and he responds to that. And I grow at the same time. Why do we honor God? Because God created everything. God is the head of the church. And apart from Christ, we're absolutely nothing. Those are good reasons right there. To, to honor him. How do we honor him? It's a heart thing, okay? Uh, Matthew 5, um, sorry, Matthew uh, 15, verse 8, says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's quoting Isaiah here. It says, they worship me in vain. Their teaching are but rules taught by men. So these people honor me, but their hearts are far from me. You cannot honor somebody just with your lips if your heart is cold, okay? Don't raise your hand. Have you ever said to your spouse or somebody that I love you, but you didn't mean it? Like your heart, your heart wasn't in there, okay? Yeah, yeah. all right, okay? Only, only those in the red chairs, not, 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 not here, I'm just kidding. But sometimes we can say something, but we don't mean it. And God is the exact same way. Honor starts in our heart. It's not about the, what we do. Is, is, is our heart in the right, is our heart wanting to honor God as we do? the things that are in front of us. So it starts in our heart. It's about worshiping in the spirit and in the truth. And it's about honoring God means obeying what he says. You can't honor God, not do what he says. Because he says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. Honoring is esteeming the value of who God is as creator of heaven and earth, me recognizing that value and, and setting, setting it apart. Honor is something that I need to, choose to do. I don't feel like I'm going to do it. I need to choose to do it. Malachi 2 verse 1 and 2 says, uh, and now this admonition I have for you, O priest. So he's he's telling the priest off. He says, if you do not listen, if you do not set your heart to honor my name, honoring is like setting your alarm clock. you, you, You know when you set your alarm clock, you've actually got to set it ahead of time if you want to wake up early. If we want to honor God, we've got to set our hearts to honor Him. Not in the moment, but ahead of time. We've got to, we've got to do that. And um, 
sorry, I lost my, lost my place there. Uh, God is calling us to set our hearts to honor him. And I want to close with this point here. In Genesis chapter 4, we see an incredible story of Cain and Abel. Two sons that wanted relationship. They were, um, uh, this is uh, in, in Genesis uh, chapter 4, we see the consequences of our hearts not being set right. Okay? So there's a prelude of chapter 1 to 3, which is basically the whole book of the Bible. And after chapter 3, it's just re-explaining the same things in detail over and over and over and over again so that we would, we would get it. And here we see two sons, okay? Um, see, Cain killed Abel. So Cain was the, uh, uh, the, the firstborn, okay? There was an expectation um, on him that he would be maybe the seed or the redemptive line by which the Savior would come, would, would, would come from. We see here already there's a lifestyle where... Uh, Cain and Abel are making sacrifices. Um, they are trying to connect to God. Um, this idea of sacrifice, they were, they were bringing what they had to God. It was already set in, in place. It probably would have been the idea that God was the author of all good things, that he only had good things for them. And it was a natural part of their trust development for them to learn to give back to God what God had already given them. All right? So what they had received, um, they wanted to give back because they trusted who this person was. But so, there's something in me that when we learn to trust God, we don't hold onto and hoard for ourselves what he gives me because I can trust the person that they're going to come through. Imagine your kids didn't trust you with their meal time. And they, every, every meal that they, they got, they just were like consumed that and never wanted to share with anybody else. But because they trust you, they know they can give some of it away. So, um, friends, when we believe that we always need more, we miss the heart of God. When we believe that our God is a God of abundance and he will supply all my needs according to his riches and glories, then it's an expression of my love that I give back to him and I sacrifice to him because I know his heart and his faithfulness. And this goes way beyond just finances, okay? It's, a, it's in all areas of our life. But we see Cain and Abel going down two different paths. Cain brought an offering to the Lord, all right, of um, his grain and, and, uh, and things like that. Abel brings the fat portions, the best portions, the first portions. Cain, the older brother, brought the leftovers of the harvest. So in other words, he looked after himself first, and then he brought God what was left over to God. Abel, on the other hand, um, brought the first and the fat parts, which means that he gave to God not knowing what was going to come next. If you give to somebody not knowing if you're going to have next, there's something in your heart that is trusting that this person is going to come through for you. It was never about the giving. It was all about the relationship of trust that was meant to be established. That's what it was about. Cain was not trusting the father to provide. Abel was trusting by bringing his first and his best to God. It demonstrates that level of, of, of trust. Whether it's our finances, our time, our talents, our emotions, whatever it might be, the first of our day, Lord, I'm too busy, I don't have time for you. Lord, I've got to make a plan. Can we trust him? What happens on the outside is always what happens, what's happening on the inside of our lives. And this is what we see here from Cain and Abel. God desires that trusting relationship. When we acknowledge God's faithfulness, okay, we return it back to him by trusting him. Trusting him reveals that we understand and that we get his heart for us. God looked on favor uh, with uh, Abel, not with Cain. Okay, Abel, he was, man, this is good. Cain, it was, what's, what, 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 the, what did the kids say? Meh. It was just meh, you know? It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't so good. All right. You know where the situation lands up going. Cain, the older brother, gets angry, gets downcrossed. And uh, God says, 
um, if you did what was right, why are you so worried? And in verse 6, he asked them why. He asked them why. God always asks us a question not for our benefit because he knows the answer. He asks us because he's trying to get us to realize where our heart is. Cain is angry. Our emotions are not always bad things, but they can point us to the root causes if we allow ourselves to look. Why am I angry? Why am I frustrated? Why am I irritated? That it exposes what's really at the bottom. Okay, God asked his Cain and Abel parents a very similar question. Why? Inviting them to repent, inviting them to come to, come to him. And then in verse 7, we see an incredibly key, key moment here. If you do what is right, uh, will you not be accepted? Cain gets angry, goes out, and he kills his brother. Okay? God again comes down and asks, what happened? Where is your brother? People misunderstand, and this is the, the heart of it. God's heart is so huge and so full of mercy. He didn't take out Cain right there. He knew that he had just killed his brother, but he was still asking, where's his brother? Giving Cain an opportunity to confess. He was inviting him in to reconcile in relationship. He was giving an opportunity to make right. That was the heart of God. Cain lands up lying and he misses it. Okay, and then there's consequences for his behavior. And for us today, um, it's easy for us to not deal with our own issues in a family and point it to somebody else. You know, man, that other person's worshiping better than me. His hands are always lifted higher and he gives a bigger offering and he's doing that. And, and then it makes us feel bad. Why? Because we are comparing ourselves. Cain was comparing himself and in a family, God is saying, guys, don't compare yourself. You be you. Stop comparing yourself, because when we compare ourselves, it leads up to destruction in our own life. These emotions that we have, if we don't deal with them and bring them to God, they will come out somewhere else later on, in a family, in our calling, in our career. And God is in the process of trying to change us into a trusting relationship with Him. Your purpose that you have is incredible, but if it's your purpose doesn't include you becoming like Christ. I don't think the Lord's fully in that because he's into both. We often make it about our issues, about somebody else. My old pastor, man, every time I used to sit with him, somehow I'd always I'd land up repenting. You know what I mean? I'm like, this situation. I'm so glad because when we always blame our irritations on somebody else and they this and they that, I'm probably not looking at me. And God is in the process of changing me into building that trust relationship with me. Let's not always point our fingers when I get offended, when something else happens. Can I take responsibility for me and my emotions? And I've gone on slightly longer this morning because God is desperate for you to trust him, to experience him, to know him. But you won't trust him while you're blaming other people and you're pointing fingers at other people. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of, of knowing you, of being loved by you. Thank you that just like Cain and Abel, Father, sometimes there's challenges that we might have that come up in our life where we've compared ourselves to somebody else, we've blamed somebody else, um, we're trying to justify our own behavior, our own religious behavior, because somebody else is doing better. This morning, Father, we recognize that you have placed us in a body. You've given us a natural family. You place us in a spiritual family. Father, forgive us if we have pointed fingers at others, if we've thought that we're better than others, if we have blamed others instead of bringing our hearts before you. It's going to take 20 seconds and just Bring your heart before the Father. If he reminds you of something, but can you say this morning, in all areas of your life, Father, I trust you for faithfulness.
Father, I thank you that there's nobody more trustworthy than you. Thank you that your promises are yes and amen and that your heart of mercy is for every person. We don't want to hold back from you. Thank you that you've got good things for relationships, good things for the future, good things for purpose and calling and destiny. And you get us to walk with frail human beings that love you as well, that are being transformed into the image of Christ. Thank you this morning that we can say, we trust you. And thank you for giving us people that can help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't you want to stand to your feet? We're going to close the service here. There's going to be people up front to, to pray. There's some donuts at the back. Um, have an incredibly blessed uh, day. Enjoy the rugby later. Okay, I think there might be a game on. Uh, and uh, please don't leave without uh, saying happy birthday to somebody and joining us for some tea and coffee at the back. God bless everybody. Thank you. Just what you said Though the storms may